Told me a long time ago if I was gonna do this, I had to be a cartoon of a woman. It wouldn't be enough to just be a woman. This is the kind of stuff they didn't teach me in charm school. I'm Karen Jaffe, also known here in San Francisco as both Kitty Tapata and her brother, Kit Tapata. I'm a San Francisco drag thing, um, do a little bit of everything. I was actually born in California and schooled in Utah, raised in Texas, which explains basically the big blonde hair and the big boobs. <laughs> I have been doing drag, well, I've been doing drag since I was born, apparently. I've argued with my mom about every outfit she ever tried to put on me. The reasons that I do drag or started doing drag are, God, there are many. But I like playing in makeup and stuff. I've, uh, you know, maybe not as good at it as I could be, but I have a good time, right? It gives me a platform and a spotlight to do the things that I want to do in my life. I did stand-up comedy for about three years, and my whole shtick was that I was this girly girl, which I guess is trying to balance out the whole male-female in me or whatever. And the more I did it, the more it was like drag. And sometimes I would end with a little song and dance number. And my friends were like, girl, you're a drag queen. You should just do this. The first time I was ever asked to perform in um, I would say, well, transvestite clothing was at a Christian church in Texas. When I was in fifth grade, I was asked to play the prodigal son in front of the whole church. And I did it because I loved it. Because at the end, I got to eat out of a trough like a pig. I would do the whole thing so that I could eat out of the trough like, you know, you work for what you work for, I work for peanuts and slop. Fundraising has always been a part of my drag performances. Either I'm raising money for myself or I'm raising money for everybody else. In fact, most of the time, because I belong to so many organizations and perform so many times at fundraisers, I rarely get to keep my tips. When people are out drinking in bars, we are gonna be out there with our hand out saying, we are raising money for this organization tonight and you're drunk, so give me what you got in there. Very recently, one of my most rewarding drag experiences or drag fundraising experiences is I host a trivia show on a regular basis at San Francisco's like only existing lesbian bar left here, the Wild Side West. Every Wednesday night, come on down. But we turned a recent one, which was just happened to be National Taco Day, into a fundraiser for Puerto Rico who at this point in time still doesn't have electricity, still doesn't have running water, and people donated food and people came in there, and we raised like $1,300 in three hours. I don't even know how people do that. So to me, that is a magic, magic thing that we get to do and I get to be a part of. I get to bring all of this joy and all of this whatever energy that I have and give it to the world in a good way because otherwise I think I'd probably be crazy. Machine works. Okay. You turn on the vacuum, 
and then there's polar, yeah, the and then you go out, and then it starts feeding paper. So, from this point, it will start picking up the sheets in it through the machine, and through those drones, which they carry the ink, so we can print the image, like, like so. So, it's gonna travel all the way through the machine and through a few cylinders, and then it's gonna come back, come back on. My name is Sergio Valdez. I'm the production coordinator for visual media department. Basically, it's offset printing. Okay. Offset meaning traditional printing. You put ink on the paper. So there's a class called Emerge Studio at Ocean Campus, which is the final class to become a designer. So we do different kinds. We do the brochures, we do uh, posters for uh, different events. Uh, for the theater department, for example, we do the poster and flyer for all the uh, events. We have also printing, so also printing in a Harvard and Chinese, uh, what is it, a Japanese press, which is the Wayobi, and a few American machines that are the chiefs, so which are the four in that very last area. And Harvard, which is German, I mean, Harvard, they're, they're the moms of the printing uh, presses. They're all like, they're the best. I mean, it's Gutenberg is the one who invented the printing press. So Germans, they're on top of it when it comes to equipment for printing. We, we get the job uh, via email. Let's say a brochure, one of those brochures, yeah. it takes uh, one week to do okay. offset printing. One day plating, mixing inks, cutting paper, the next day printing one side and then the next day printing the other side then you gotta cut it then you gotta fold it so it's a full week of work let's say for example if it's a four color job like sometimes what we do since we have we have a a, a two color press so it will do if it's a full color job like this it will send four different plates okay. but if you you if you're not sure whether this is a four color job you know, or it's gonna be a two color job you just make basically gotta turn off whatever other colors you're not using and it will print just two colors normally we do two colors because we don't want to do four it's more times to the machine it's more money it costs more money for for the client to pay. And since it's City College, our client, normally they don't want to pay. Let's say, for example, this, this, let's say this poster, if you want to do the offset, it's going to cost you like a thousand dollars, 500 sheets, if it's going to be four color. If it's a three, two colors, it's kind of cheap, like two, three hundred dollars for a two color versus a thousand food. So it's really a, a lot, like, it used to be like, Four different people that like one is to be take care of, taking care of the pre-press, the other one running the press, and the other one doing the bindery. Now they want one person to be able to do all that, but you have to be really good because, I mean, I people will think that what I do is really easy, but when it comes to do it, if you can do it, my respects because I know how, how like you have to be very knowledgeable in general. And that's why it's kind of that's why I still have a job because I can do all that. Otherwise, I probably would have done. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's perfect. Do you understand what I was saying? Can, yeah, I, can, yeah, I, yeah, can I show you what I'm talking about? Because yeah, let's, it makes do, more let's, sense let's, let's see if we can do the plate making process. Yeah, great. So I got started in dog training at a very young age, working with the neighbor's dogs and then our family dogs. Started out teaching tricks and then um, moved up to Sonoma County with my mom and we were quite poor. And I trained my first dog to hunt pheasant. Mostly bird dogs, kind of took off from there, just neighbor's dogs and hunting dogs. So I pretty much got started around 16 years old. 
I didn't know I was good with dogs at first. It, uh, it took a minute. But uh, the more I watched them and interacted with them, I realized I could communicate with them fairly well. I've been open for business in this facility for five years now. Uh, prior to that, we did this out of our house. First going out to folks' houses and dealing with the problems in an hourly setting and then moved it into our garage in our home and then we opened up this facility here. I've been working at Dan Prada training for just under three years now. I, I do enjoy it. This is probably the best job I've ever had. But we're all here because we love animals so much to the point where, you know, I'll spend a lot of extra time here just because I want to make sure that the dogs in my facility are calm, comfortable, and happy. So my training philosophy would be neutral association. The dogs associate everything. And so we take what nature's given the dog and we bring out the best of them. They associate it whether it's good or bad. For example, a dog that would counter surf. Um, you can throw biscuits down for the dog to try to get him to not go up on the counter, or you could clap your hands and scare him once or twice. And he'd associate that loud noise with him being up on the counter, and therefore they won't go up onto the counter again. So they'll associate it, whether it be positive or negative. This is a different technique than other people. Other people tend to use punitive, which would be shock collars, pinch collars, and choke chains or they use positive reinforcement in the way of the biscuit, where we use positive reinforcement in the way of the touch. Love and affection is what the dog is after, and so we use that. Everything for the dog is in the moment, and that's because of their nose. They have over 300 million olfactor in their nose, and that keeps them in the present. I do think that people think dogs think like people, and it's unfortunate, because they don't. They think like dogs, again, right? When you think about it, uh, we humanize our dogs way too much. We put all our emotions on our dogs, and our dogs never put their emotions on us. And we tend to treat them like people and spoil them. And that doesn't make for a very well-behaved dog. You're not going to get a well-behaved puppy to adult dog under two years. To have that awesome take everywhere, off-leash, nothing bothers it, it's a minimum two years. All dogs are different, just like people, right? You have to adapt to the dog to a certain degree. Our style of training across the board is very similar. We treat all dogs the same way by making all the decisions for them and not allowing them to make decisions, and that tends to keep them well-balanced and happy. A calm and confident dog is a dog that listens and has boundaries and takes direction very well. Most people come here for leash aggression, dog aggression, leash pulling, uh, and you know, and other issues like stay, leave it here, which is mostly what we teach of the dog that you know, just doesn't necessarily listen because they haven't been taught how to do that yet. The top three things that people do wrong with their dog, they don't train it, they let it sleep on the bed, and they put all their emotions on them. Train your dog. Spend the time and train your dog, right? Give it boundaries, teach it what you need it to know, but spend the time to train it and then love it the rest of your life. Despite being properly credentialed as one of the oldest and continuously lesbian owned and operated and patronized watering holes this side of the Sierras, Wild Side West doesn't really identify as lesbian. However, lesbians have always carried the torch through each stage of its storied history. I came from Texas, so I was looking for every lesbian bar I could find. Wild Side West was conceived in Oakland on Grove Street in 1962. Her founders, Pat Ramsayer and Nancy White, named her for the Barbara Stanwyck movie about a lesbian madam, Walk on the Wild Side. But how do you think the boy is going to feel when he finds out what you are, what you've been? He'll forgive me. Now, I want to know what's going on between you and that boy. You in love with that Texas dirt farmer? <laughs> I've been coming to the Wild Side West, not this location, but the original location, or second location. Um, I walked in in 1970, and I was 20. And uh, I know, and that's 46 years ago. 
that I would be coming here. Bear in mind that in 1962, it was illegal in California for a woman to be a bartender. So Nancy serving up beers to East Bay baby dykes was already a revolutionary act in itself. I came to the Wild Side the night I moved to San Francisco in 1985, two weeks before my 30th birthday, and never left. From Oakland, Wild Side West moved two more times, once to San Francisco's Wild North Beach, and finally to its current Bernal Heights location. I mean, the way I remember it, there was, there was no gay straight division in the bar so much as there was a, like, asshole, not asshole division. And it was fine to be weird. It was probably more appreciated if you were weird. If Wild Side West's ghosts could talk, they would tell tales of everything from Janis Joplin in the flesh, playing pool, and sharing a bit of her music, to off-duty dancing girls from Big Al's, hanging out after a long night of entertaining men. All the dancing girls that were just beautiful, they were really hot, and come to find out, you know, it was, it was like a real shock to me that these girls were into girls. You know, I thought they were into guys because, you know, they were doing all this pleasure-seeking thing for, for the guys that come in paying to go into big owls and stuff. Less than two days after the bar opened in its current Bernal Heights location, the neighbors welcomed them by throwing a big rock right through the front window as people were sitting in the bar. A couple of nice broken toilets were also tossed in the window on another night. Pat and Nancy and their renegade group of backyard gardeners turned the porcelain fixtures into lovely flower pots in Wild Side West's incredible secret garden. Wild Side West continues to welcome all. There is always a small altar to Pat at the end of the bar at Wild Side West. Pat passed it on to Billy and Bill, Bill, Billy has just, you know, let Pat's plants grow, let the bar still serve beers, let the people come in and have joy and have instruments and birthday parties and cook and do all the things just as if Pat was here. So I feel very fortunate because I've seen places come and go. But I've, I forever will have the Wall Side West, and it's just fantastic, you know.